Welcome, everyone. I'm going to try to get us off to a timely start because, as I'll mention in a minute, we face a few time pressures on the back end of our event. Uh, I'd, like you to I'd like to welcome you to the second in this year's Research Group on Constitutional Studies Lecture Series. The RGCS Lecture Series is supported by a generous gift to McGill from the Aurea Foundation and aims to bring into McGill's academic life and, in particular, into undergraduate and student intellectual life, research and leading researchers on the values, institutions, and principles of a free society, aiming to show quite what leading research on fundamental questions of the organization of free society can look like and how many difficult questions at those frontiers remain to be answered. It also aims to engage in a number of kinds of bridge building across disciplines and across approaches, trying to remain interested in both high-level theory and a great deal of attention to social science and to law, making our lecturer for today a very appropriate choice. Um, before I turn to the introduction for today, I'll mention those time constraints at the end. First, for those in particular political science students who are interested in going to the Political Science Student Association debate on Bill 60, which is around the corner and down one flight of stairs. That had been scheduled to start at 6. You don't need to sneak out at 5.58. The PSSA has agreed to hold that beginning until 6.15. However, there is another event in this room starting at 7, and I have promised the organizers of that event, that we will be done with our reception by 6.45. So as usual after the RGCS lectures, we'll invite you to join us for a reception outside this room, uh, but we will then wrap up that reception a little bit on the early side, and please be sure to have the space clear so that the people who want to listen to Malcolm Gladwell via simulcast can get into the room and do so. It is my great pleasure for today to introduce Naomi Lamoureux, who is Stanley B. Resser Professor of Economics and History and Chair of the Department of History at Yale University. Professor Lamoureux is, if I may put it this way, both one of our leading historians of economic organization and one of our leading economic historians, by which I mean precisely that she bridges that gap that I mentioned between real attention to historical social scientific detail, doing a great deal of her work as one of the leading scholars of firms, corporations, organizational forms in 19th century, especially American business life, and also recurringly through her career, putting what she's found in her historical case studies into conversation with high-level economic and law and economic theorizing about firm shape, about firm size, about property rights, about economic life. Whereas I think uh, all too many of the historians and uh, case study-oriented researchers of some of that material treat the detail and complexity that they find as a reason to simply reject the high-level abstractions and simplifications that they find when they turn to economic theory. Professor Lamoureux has long moved back and forth between the two, not rejecting, but rather looking for more complexity in the economic theory, and then taking the economic theory or the law and economic theory back again as raising new research questions for the empirical world of organizational and economic history that she studies. She has been professor of economics, history, and law at UCLA, professor of history at Brown University, co-editor of the Journal of Economic History, president of the, Ameri of the Economic History Association. She's been recognized with a large number of awards, including the CLIO for Exceptional Support to the Field of Cleometrics, that is the Quantitative Study of History a prize for the best article published in early American economic history, a prize 
from the Economic History Association for the best article in the Journal of Economic History, and the Alice Hansen Jones Prize awarded to the Economic History Association for the best book on North American economic history. She's also been recognized with prestigious fellowships, including a Guggenheim Fellowship. She's been president of the Business History Conference, and she's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's the author of Insider Lending, Banks, Personal Connections, and Economic Development in Industrial New England, and of the Great Merger Movement in American Business, 1895 to 1904, as well as the editor uh, or co-editor of a number of volumes on team projects in which she continues the task of trying to bring together research and researchers from different disciplines into engagement on common questions about what the organizational life of economics, of American economies in particular, uh, has been like and what kinds of questions we should continue to ask. Please join me in welcoming Professor Naomi Lamarow. All right, good. Jacob, thank you so much for that um, astounding introduction. And it, it means a tremendous amount to me coming from one of the people in political theory that I most admire. So thank you very much. Uh, the talk today um, is based on a paper that John Wallace and I wrote as a prompt for a set of conferences run by the National Bureau of Economic Research on the topic of organizations, civil society, and the roots of development. We have um, involved Jacob in that project as well. Uh, and so this, this talk today is going to draw, uh, draw on that prompt that John and I wrote, and also some of the papers that John and I and others wrote for uh, the most recent of that set of conferences. Now, this set of conferences was motivated uh, by a, a dissatisfaction that John and I shared with the existing literature on voluntary associations and civil society. So I, I'm going to try to give you a flavor of, of where that dissatisfaction comes from today. Uh, but this literature starts in a number of different places, but one of the texts that it, it refers back to uh, repeatedly is, of course, Tocqueville's um, famous Democracy in America. T Tocqueville uh, traveled in the United States in the early 1930s and then wrote up his observations in um, that famous two-volume uh, set. And so famously, of course, he, he said, um, Americans of all ages, all conditions, and all dis dispositions constantly form associations. And then he went on to say they form associations for business, they for, uh, uh, form associations for religious purposes, for clubs, for all kinds of things. They have an idea, they form an association. Now Tocqueville thought that there was a connection uh, between, between this habit of forming associations and Americans' unprece unprecedented extent of, of democracy. And so he asserted, right, that there is only one country on the face of the earth where citizens enjoy unlimited freedom of association for purposes, and that's also the country which is the only one in the world where there is a continued exercise of the right of association. Now for Tocqueville, there was a mutually reinforcing relationship between democracy and this habit of, of forming associations. Causation went in both directions. But he worried that states were more likely to repress political associations than, any, than other kinds of associations. And, that if they, and he worried that if they did that, if they repressed political associations, for obvious reasons, right? Um, then that that would put a damper on all this other associational activity. And so, uh, and so um, this is a long quote which you can look at, but the key point is here is that when members of the community are allowed and accustomed to combine for all purposes, they will combine as readily for the lesser and the more important ones. But if they're not allowed to combine for, for small purposes, um, 
they, w they will be neither inclined nor able to af affect it. Now, in a footnote, he went on to say that it's even worse in situations where associations are disallowed by some administrative body that had discretionary authority. And, wh and what he was thinking about, of course, at this time was, was France. Tocqueville's implicitly comparing the United States with his home country of France, where there was no free right of association at that time for political purposes or for most social purposes. And he thought the United States was completely different. And as a result of this difference, you got this, this mutually reinforcing uh, uh, relationship between associational activity and democracy. And that's a sort of profound insight that he had. Very interesting. But he kind of gets the U.S. wrong. This, so I'm going to, what this, this picture is going, what this talk is going to be about is the kind of facts that Jacob was talking about, some surprising facts perhaps, and then we're going to use them to reflect back on, uh, on, on political theory. So, um, so Tocqueville uh, got the ordinal ranking of the U.S. and uh, and France correct. Associational life was a lot freer in the United States than it was in France. Um, but basically, the, the difference was that in the United States, lots of associations formed for a variety of purposes had a right to exist. They could just be formed and exist and no one would bother them, and that was not the case in France. Now here's what this talk is about. I'm going to argue that the right to exist is obviously important. It's the starting point, but it only gets you so far, okay? I want to argue that for associations to work well, to be effective, to be able to be large, to be complicated, uh, to, to do important things, you need something more than the simple right to exist. You need what, what John Wallace and I call access to organizational tools okay, that the state provides. Now that's going to seem, that seems a little vague right now, but I'm going to make that more concrete in, in this talk. And what, what I'm going to suggest to you is that at the time that Tocqueville was writing, the U.S. in terms of the availability of organizational tools was just like France. That is, there was no open access to organizational tools. And I'm also going to suggest that this access um, was gradually provided over the course of the 19th century, but it was slower, more uneven, more incomplete than, uh, than most people realize. And certainly, uh, Tocqueville was not... Uh, was not aware of it. And so what I wanted to use then is this, uh, this moving beyond um, uh, uh, just the simple right to exist to looking at the availability of organizational tools as a way of, of uh, thinking uh, in the end about this uh, relationship that Tocqueville hypothesized between associational activity and American democracy. Um, we're going to question, at the end, we might question that relationship a little bit more. Um, but this talk is only going to have questions. It's not going to have answers. Uh, so in the end, it's, I'll love to hear um, your own views on, on, on the questions. All right, so we need to start with some definitions, some simple theory. And I just want to begin uh, by acknowledging um, the book that John and I are jumping off from in our own work, which is a, a, a book by Douglas North and John Wallace and Barry Weingass called Violence and Social Orders. And so if you want further reading, this is a good place uh, to start. And let me uh, begin very quickly by being clear about what I mean by civil society. So I'm going to define civil society as the organizations that occupy 
an intermediate space between the organizations that or, that are um, that are characteristic of the most inter, uh, intimate spheres of life, for example, the family, and those that constitute the state, for example, government. And so we're going to include in this in this definition organizations that are formed for business purposes, but also political, religious, educational, uh, social, and and on and on. So the first important question to ask is, what do organizations do? Why do we want to fo focus on organizations? And the simple answer is what organizations do is they coordinate human activity. And because they coordinate human activity, they enable human beings to do things they could not do on their own. They create value, or in economic jargon, they, they create rents. So just to give you a couple of examples, the rents could be monetary. So for example, when two business people who have complementary capabilities or complementary assets come together, they might be able to, in association, to do things that create value that they couldn't do alone. So think, for example, of someone who has entrepreneurial talent or a technological invention but no capital, and someone else who has capital but no talent for entrepreneurship and no ideas, and they come together, they can create something of value. So it can be monetary, these, this value of these rents, but they can also be psychological. So just to give you a very different kind of example, imagine uh, that two people who come together to pray might find that more psychologically satisfying than just praying on their own, right? So that relationship then creates value, creates rents. Now, for some organizations, for some types of organizations, the value that the organizations create is, is enough to hold them together. So we'll call those kinds of organizations adherent organizations. Um, they tend to be small. For larger, more complex organizations, you need something else. You need some type of external enforcement. And we call these contractual organizations. So we might think that there's really two different types of organizations. Okay. There are adherent organizations, tend to be small, simple, rely on internal enforcement. All they need is the right to exist. Okay, so, so, so that's really what Tocqueville was observing, right, by just looking at those organizations in the United States. You can form a lot of organizations, small organizations, simple organizations. Um, if you just have the right to exist. And there were lots of them in the 1830s United States where Tocqueville wandered around, but not in France. Okay. Contractual organizations, on the other hand, um, are, can be much larger, can be more complex, can do a lot more things, but they have to rely on some kind of external enforcement to work. And this is really what I'm talking about when I'm talking about access to organizational tools, that the state has to provide something that will provide that enforcement, and allow those contractual organizations to grow and be more complex. And what Tocqueville did not notice, okay, was that these tools were not generally available in the US in the 1930s. And they were, of course, not generally available in uh, France either. All right, so let me make this, there's lots of different kinds of organizational tools if you think about it, but let me make this discussion more concrete by talking about one important type of organizational tools. And those are the tools that we associate, the bundle of tools that we associate with the corporate form. Okay, so there's these kinds of things. Uh, and what I want to do is, um, dem is first talk about the importance of these tools by comparing two types of business associations, partnerships, which are, at least historically, partnerships now have a lot of organizational tools, so we want to think historically. Partnerships at the time Tocqueville was writing, partnerships which were adherent organizations, and uh, corporations, which were contractual organizations. Now, not all corporations have all of these tools. So this is a sort of general bundle. In fact, historically, a lot of them didn't have these last two. But 
even this first group is really important if you just think for think about it for a moment. Like legal personhood, that's the right to sue and be sued in the association name. If you don't have that right to sue and be sued in the association name, then you can't grow very large because it's just too complicated to engage in legal activity. You have to name, get all the parties to sign on to every legal action. Concentrated management. Um, in corporations, you can uh, you can concentrate management in a particular group of people and only those people have the ability to act on behalf of the firm. And that means that if the corporation wants to borrow money, lenders know exactly who can sign on behalf of the firm. Partnerships are much more complicated. Anybody can go off and do anything and act as if he or she is the sole or owner of the enterprise. Entity shielding. This is uh, very important. That's that the uh, that corporations can protect their assets from claims against their members. So if one of the members of a corporation goes bankrupt, that person's investment in the corporation is sunk, and creditors can't go take it away. Okay, but they can in a partnership, at least historically. Uh, Limited liability, that's owner shielding. That means that's the flip side of it, where the assets of the members of the firm are protected against claims on the enterprise itself. That's very valuable. If you're in a partnership and the partnership runs into problems, um, the creditors can come after you, but they can't if you're a member of a corporation. And then finally, there's, there's perpetual life. Uh, corporations have uh, lives that are beyond the lives of their individual members. If you're a member of a partnership and you want to quit or you, want, or you die, uh, the, uh, the, the partnership has to dissolve. But that's not true uh, of a corporation. Now, so obviously these, this bundle of attributes is very useful for business purposes. It's also useful for the purposes of other kinds of associations as well, for voluntary associations. It's useful for them to have these attributes. And rather than step through all this, um, uh, again, in the case of a voluntary association, what I'd like to do is give you an example that shows it, that it may even be more important um, historically for voluntary associations to be incorporated. Uh, because, uh, because, because that ability to hold property is very important for, for voluntary associations. And let me give you an example which, has, which is, underscores the political dimensions of what I'm talking about. This is a legal case from 1888, United States. So 50, more than 50 years after Tocqueville wrote, right? So, and what happened in this case was that a man named George Hutchins, who had a lot of wealth, left a bequest to Henry George in the name of the Hutchins Fund for the express purpose of spreading the light on social and political liberty and justice. Uh, one of the heirs, or actually all the heirs, his, his family sued to avoid the request. They wanted the money for themselves. And they won. Um, the, the bequest was declared by the court to be void um, because Henry George denounced secure title to land in private, uh, uh, in private individuals as robbery. You know, property is theft. There's, there's this common expression in that, in that period of time and later. Uh, and, uh, and although charitable associations that were not incorporated could receive bequests, um, the court determined in this case that this was not a legal charity, and so they voided the request. Now, if Henry George had been, an organization had been incorporated, this would have been no problem because, uh, because corporations could hold property, could receive bequests. And, and so here's the important thing, the thing that Tocqueville never noticed, that groups like Henry George's that advocated social and political change rarely met, met, met the qualifications for incorporation in the United States in the 19th century. They just couldn't get charters. They could exist, okay, but they couldn't get charters, and that mattered. So 
this, this brings us back to a little bit more theory, to, to the question of, well, why would the state deny access to corporate tools, um, or for that matter, as in France, the right to exist, to organizations like, like George's? Well, in a certain sense, the answer is obvious, right? Uh, the, the answer is obvious because, because organizations like George's were perceived as posing threats to the property rights order, or to the social order, or to the state. Uh, and so uh, they were not welcomed <laughs> into the fold of organizations who could, uh, who could receive these tools. But there's got to be more to the story than this, OK? There's got to be more to the story than this. Because, because for much in the 19th century, even business organizations, most business organizations, were denied access to these kinds of organizational tools. And they could not be thought to pose a threat in the same way as, as these kinds of voluntary associations. So in order to understand what's going on, why access to these tools is limited, why it's only relaxed very slowly, we have to go beyond simply thinking of these organizations as threats to the state to step back and, and think about rents again. And the way I want to think about it is to remind you that really through most of history, this is the argument of North Wallace and Weingast, through most of history, most states have, have not been democracies, but have been run by dominant coalitions uh, of elites um, who, are, um, who are using the rents to hold their coalitions together, using the rent from organizations to hold their coalitions together. So here's a simple diagram uh, where we could think of the big, the capital A and capital B as leaders, members of the elite. This horizontal ellipse represents uh, an adherent organization that holds the members of the elite together, holds the coalitions together, and it's just simply held together by rents. And then these are the separate organizations that these people had. And so what might be the source of rents that hold this adherent organization together? Well, you could imagine these as, you know, historically as feudal lords who are, who are controlling territories. And it may be that the agreement, these, these territories are valuable and the agreement is simply, is, uh, the rent creating agreement is just simply that they're not going to attack each other. They're going to let each other control their territory. Or it could be um, that if there's a revolt here, B will come to A's aid. Or if there's a revolt here, A will come to B's aid. So those are very simple sources of rents that could historically create ruling coalitions. But these ruling coalitions can be, can be solidified by restricting access to other kinds of rents as well, to the kinds of rents that other organizations can generate, in particular to economic rents. And so if you think about it, during the early modern period, monarchs and, and rulers more generally um, restricted access to rent generating activities to their political to their political supporters. So the British East India Company was a, a charter, which was a, a monopoly, which was awarded to, um, to people who were politically favored. And uh, the idea is that if you cut the people who are in your coalition into these rents, they'll be loyal, they'll, they'll support you. So throughout, so throughout the early modern period, um, there's all kinds of monopolies that are granted as ways of solidifying um, the ruling co coalition of ways of making sure that the rents go to the favored members of the coalition and, and, and not to uh, people who are not loyal. It's a way of building loyalty. And, and the corporate form was similarly restricted because the corporate form was a way to make organizations more effective to generate rents. And so access to the corporate form was simil similarly restricted to people who were um, politically favored. OK. Now, throughout history, then, this, this kind of a limited access order where access to, or, um, to organizational rents 
is, is limited, is self-perpetuating. So on the one hand, restricting access to rents might help uh, stabilize the ruling coalition, um, but it can also create incentives for revolt, right? Because there are, might be members of the coalition who want a larger share, um, or there might be members of outgroups who want to get control of these valuable rents. And so that can be an incentive to rebellion. But when the rebellion occurs, you just get more of the same, because this is a rebellion about, about uh, the spoils. So it's kind of an endless cycle throughout history. You have these dominant coalitions restricting access to the favored few, then you get a revolt, and then you get another dominant coalition that restricted access to the favored few. And that goes on and on and on over the centuries. Okay, until something happened. Um, something happened in a few places, maybe Britain, maybe the United States, then a few other places. Something happened. Something happened in the modern period that began to get us out of, of this cycle. But what happened? So when we think about, uh, so th I th when we think about uh, these countries and the changes that, that, that brought an end to these kinds of limited access orders, we tend to think about the age of revolutions, right? We think about the glorious revolution. We think about the American Revolution. We think about the French Revolution. We think about other revolutions. But obviously, it can't be that simple, right? The French Revolution didn't do it. Tocqueville, <laughs> Tocqueville's a, a witness. Um, and in fact, what I'm going to show, suggest to you is that the other revolutions may have set in motion changes that were very important, but the, change, but, but the results did not lead in any straightforward or any inevitable way to the end to this limited access order. And in fact, what I want to suggest to you is that the first products of these revolutions, the Glorious Revolution and the American Revolution, are just the same cycle again. Okay? So let me run through uh, uh, a couple of examples. Um, so let's talk about the Glorious Revolution. You know, there's a lot of hype about the Glorious Revolution in, in, in political theory and in economic history, about you know, really how much it changed the British, limited government, secure property rights, all this stuff. Um, but really, the new government that was created in England as a result of the Glorious Revolution was extremely fragile. And it suppressed organizations that seemed to pose a threat to it in the 18th century. Um, and it used these old tools of limiting access to organizational rents to solidify a ruling coalition and bring about political stability. That's the Whig coalition, right? So, you know, for example, the British East India Company, it's, uh, the, the monopoly continues. It's just awarded to a different group of people who are associated with the dominant Whig group. And you can see this dynamic working in the case of the Bank of England. And banking is going to be a main thread of this, so I'm going to just take a little bit of time and do a little bit more with the Bank of England. So the Bank of England was chartered in, in 1694, five years after the Glorious Revolution, as a part of a desperate attempt to bolster the, the finances of, of the government, which was involved in costly wars. So here's the account in, uh, famous account in, uh, uh, in North and Wine Guest. Basically what happened is after the Glorious Revolution, the government managed to place a very large loan a million pounds with its political uh, supporters, um, but it burned through the money really fast. So what is it going to do? So they come up with this, this, this idea, the Bank of England. And basically what happens is the government invited wealthy and powerful individuals to subscribe to a new loan issue and then immediately deposit those, uh, those bonds it, or trade those bonds in exchange for shares of the Bank of England. And they leapt at, the, they leapt at this deal. And you can see 
that one third of the loan was subscribed on the first day, another third in the next two days, uh, and then 10 days later it's fully subscribed. So why did they leap at this? Well, because they got access to some valuable organizational tools in exchange. Okay. So they got, as a result of this, the right to form a corporation that would engage in banking activities with limited liability for its investors. And then they got the right also to issue currency in the form of, of Bank of England notes, which was essentially an interest-free way of raising money that they could lend out. In other words, they got some privileges that enabled them to earn valuable rents. So crucially, uh, Parliament limited the bank's charter to a term of 11 years. So what that meant was that if the Bank of England's charter was valuable to these people who subscribed to it. Then when the charter lapsed in 11 years, then Parliament could extract another loan in exchange for some more privileges. And that's basically what happened. Uh, I, this is a kind of a table. I won't, I won't go through it except to say that what it's really showing is that the bank gets rechartered frequently and every time there's a new loan, and every time there's new privileges for the bank. So basically, very quickly, by 1708, Parliament has promised that it will not charter any banks in competition with the Bank of England. And it has further promised that no unincorporated partnership of more than six partners, no unincorporated joint stock company, can compete with the bank. So it was very valuable. And the story doesn't change. This, this is what really, this kind of thing is what solidifies the Whig co coalition, um, brings political stability to England, and it doesn't change until the 19th century. The story is much the same after the American Revolution. Um, there's a period of instability after the American Revolution. The national government attempts to s suppress uh, competing organizations to some extent. Think of um, the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, but more important, uh, Alexander Hamilton at the head of the Treasury Department of the new national government is trying to use these same tactics to solidify uh, an elite behind the, uh, behind the new national government. And so he very consciously is building a coalition of, of the wealthy and powerful behind the uh, new national government. And he does this with uh, national debt, right? He thinks if you can just get the wealthy to hold the debt, they'll have an interest in the national government. He, that's why he assumes the state debts. He's very frank about it. He says, if we don't assume the state banks, banks debt, the state's debts, then all these people will have loyalties to the state, not the national government, and that's, that's a bad thing. But the most important thing that he did was the Bank of the United States. And, and this was a bank that he envisioned doing something very similar to the Bank of England, to what the Bank of England had done for the Whigs. And he models it on the Bank of England, uh, though not slavishly. So just give you a few examples. The capital stock of the bank is payable in national debt, not 100% the way the Bank of England was, three quarters, but, but that's a way of getting people to invest in the national government and then getting some organizational tools that are rent creating in exchange. And he was really determined that, these, uh, that, these, that, this, the, that this be rent creating for the elite. So he was adamant that that there was going to be a, that this bank was going to have a monopoly. No similar institution will be established by any future act of the United States. And that's key, right, to this process of rent generation. Now, one of the most interesting things about the document that Hamilton sent to Congress is he has to make this promise credible to investors. And he has this terrible worry and that is that there already is a national bank, the Bank of North America, which was chartered uh, by Congress under the Articles, 
Now, it wasn't clear that Congress had the right to do this, so the bank also got a charter from the state of Pennsylvania. People in Pennsylvania were anti-bank, and they thought this was kind of corrupt, this kind of thing was corrupt. So they repealed the charter, and then they, the next year, in, uh, this is in uh, 1786, they, in, they create a new charter, which is much more restricted. And Hamilton's very worried about this. He actually devotes six of the 15 pages of his report on the bank to this problem of, of that it's okay, to, because of what Pennsylvania did, it's okay to create this, this uh, bank in competition with the Bank of North America. But he still says, well, if the state of Pennsylvania gets its act together, then then we'll go back, we'll merge the two institutions so there will only be one. And so this is rent generating. He's really, he's really concerned to give the impression that this, is, that this is going to generate rents for the elite. And he has a similar kind of symbiotic relationship in terms of rechartering uh, that, uh, in mind that, that, that the Bank of England represented. So, uh, f for example, he, go, he, he says, now, the bank is chartered for 20 years, so that's going to ensure that the bank will operate in the interests of, of, the, of the government, because it has to be rechartered. But the government, too, can, has it in its power to offer reciprocal benefits to the bank. Right? So he has the same notion that that they're going to use this monopoly and this, and this symbiotic relationship between the government and the monopoly to solidify this elite behind the national government. Well, it didn't quite work that way um, in the U.S. case uh, because what happened is um, the Jeffersonians thought that this was corrupt. And so the, well, the bank was chartered for 20 years. Instead of extracting more rents and in exchange for more privileges, the Jeffersonians were in control of the government, and they, and they killed the bank. Um, and then you have the War of 1812, and they go, oh, yeah, that's why we needed a bank, because it would finance a war. So then they create the bank again, the second bank in the United States, charter for 20 years again. But then the Jeffersonian successors, the Jacksonians, are in power when, when that bank comes up for recharter, so they kill it again. So we never get um, that same kind of stability that you get in, in Britain. But the point I want to emphasize here is that the federal government never, never, in the years that Tocqueville was writing, or even in the first half of the 19th century, even up to the Civil War, ever got out of this mindset. No one in the federal government. It was either that you have these monopoly institutions that are going to generate rents, or you have nothing. But there's, no, there's nothing in between. Where all the change happens, and this is really important, is at the state level. I don't know why we focus on the national government in American history, because nothing that doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, everything that matters occurs at the state level. And, and this whole process of moving from this kind of limited access to open access is going on in the state level, and it's going on in exactly um, in a very slow and uneven and painful way um, where people are trying to work out a different order. And they're doing it kind of accidentally. So I'm going to give you one more banking example, um, and that's the uh, Massachusetts Bank, which was chartered in 1784. The Federalists were in control of Massachusetts. They chartered the Massachusetts Bank with the idea that it would be a monopoly like the Bank of the United States or like the Bank of England. It primarily benefited a, a small group of Federalist merchants, so even the other Federalists were not happy. And so some other Federalists uh, clamored to get a second bank chartered, and it was chartered in 1792. Um, one of the organizational tools, again, that banks get besides corporate existence is this ability to issue currency in the form of banknotes. And these two banks, the Massachusetts Bank and this second bank, the Union Bank of Boston, were the only banks in Boston um, until 1811, when all of a sudden everything changed. 
And uh, I want to explain what changed, um, but before I do, I just want to say that this, this same process is occurring throughout the state of Massachusetts. There's, there's a few more banks chartered in other places in Massachusetts, but the idea is basically the same. There's only going to be a, a, a monopoly bank in a city or occasionally, as in Boston, a duopoly. Um, and then, uh, but, uh, but, but there isn't going to be competition in banking. This is about generating political rents. This is about taking advantage of economic rents for political purposes. And the only people who get these banks are Federalists until 1811. All right, so what happens in 1811? Well, what happens, here's a, politics matters, okay? This is a, a, a chart of, uh, which shows the composition of the Massachusetts Senate. Uh, for um, f until 1824, and the, the House looks very similar. And what you can see is initially the Federalists are really dominant, but then politics becomes more competitive. And what happens in 1811 is that the Democratic Republicans, the main competitor to the Federalists, get power in the state of Massachusetts. They not only take the Senate, they take, uh, they take control of uh, the House, and they take control of the governor's office. And in fact, to underscore sort of what's going on, so they take control, and then their idea is that they're just going to, they're going to take control of the economic rents. And they're going to solidify their position using economic rents. Uh, uh, and the Federalists will never get back in power. That's sort of the, the idea. So to underscore the point, let me just mention the name of the governor who takes power in this period of time. It's Elbridge Jerry. Okay, so what do we know about him? He's the person who gives us the word gerrymandering because one of the things they did was to redistrict to solidify Democratic-Republican control. They also did things like uh, uh, kick the Federalists out of, political offices, re redistribute the patronage to their own people. They took over corporations that are, they tried to take over corporations that already existed that they thought were value creating. Harvard was a good example. There's a fight over Harvard. Um, but their really big chance was in banking. And the really big chance was in banking because all of the Federalist banks, for some crazy reason, were set to expire, their charters were set to expire in 1812. Okay, so what happens? They say we're not going to uh, recharter you, and so basically it's a big fight. Uh, the 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 Democratic Republicans. The there's a bribery going on. If you can see this, so they create a subcommittee, give them two thousand dollars to try to argue for their charter. This is the original Massachusetts bank. Um, there, but this bank was recharted. But basically, the Federalists refused to. I mean, the Democratic Republicans refused to charter additional banks, and instead they began to recharter the Federalist banks, and instead they began to create their own banks, including a, the State Bank of Massachusetts, which was in Boston, which was huge, chartered at $30 million, which was 30 times the size of any bank which was in existence to that time. Okay, so what happened though, you know, who knows what would have happened if the Democratic Republicans had stayed in power, but they didn't. So that part of the story here is that politics is competitive, right? Politics is now competitive. So who knows what, it, what would have happened if they, if they stayed in power. But what happened is that the, the, the Democratic-Republican administration's policies with regard to foreign wars, Madison's policies with regard to exports were not popular in Massachusetts. And so, uh, and so, the, um, and so the Federalists got back in power. And then you know, we, they can recharter their own banks. So, but what, what seems to have happened as a result of this episode is that the Federalists and the Republicans realize that politics is different now. It's competitive. And if you're in now, you're going to be out in the future. And so it doesn't make sense to have such important economic institutions always at stake. 
Now, in, now whether people can always recognize their economic self-interest is not clear, but in this case, there was a sweetener. And that sweetener was that when the state bank was created, a tax on the state bank was levied of um, a half of 1% on the bank's capital. It was a huge bank. And when the Federalists rechartered their banks, they added that tax. Uh, it was part of a deal that they added that tax to all subsequent bank charters as a way of getting the state bank to continue to pay the tax. And that was really important because then it turned out they didn't need property taxes in Massachusetts anymore. Taxes, property taxes were very low. In 20 out of uh, the years between 1820 and 1855, there are no property taxes in Massachusetts. They were either zero or very low throughout this period. So there's a tremendous incentive then to give up that old rent-seeking politics and instead charter lots of banks. And so that's what happened in uh, Massachusetts. Okay, there's a similar story in New York. I'm going to skip it. Uh, uh, and the only point I want to make about the New York story is that it's very similar, but it takes a lot more time. Even though you get political competition, they don't learn for a long time. They don't learn until the 1830s. And as a result, you get, you get real economic consequences. So bank capital for, per capita in New York and Massachusetts starts out at very similar levels. And then in Massachusetts, it's a much more banking capital rich state than New York. As late as 1860, it's got about twice as much bank capital per capita than New York. So this has real economic consequences. Okay. All right. Then if we, if we want to think about, this is a story that carries over to other kinds of incorporation as well. So in manufacturing, for example, a few states very early on create open access to, uh, to, to, uh, to corporate tools, to these organizational tools. But throughout the period that, that Tocqueville was in the United States, there's very few states that do this. The big change comes later in, in the 18, late 1840s and 50s. And when it does, um, it it looks weird, right? Um, because New York, is, which was a laggard in banking, is a leader in open access to organizational tools and manufacturing. Uh, some states follow New York and then they repeal the laws right away and don't come back in until the 1840s. So again, what the point I want to emphasize is this is all happening in a very uneven way. It's uneven across states, but the states aren't even in any consistent ranking. A state might move to open access in one area and then not in another. So I just want to emphasize um, two things. Um, as, as states move from this world of closed access, uh, restricted access to organizational tools, you have to go to the legislature to get a charter, it's only done to political favorites, to this general incorporation law, um, uh, open access. It's really not in the first half of the night in the 19th century complete open access. Um, because what happens is that all those people who thought of uh, the Jeffersonians, for example, the Jacksonians, who thought of corporations as having, um, as being these tools of monopoly, want to put all kinds of limits on these corporations. They want to restrict what they're able to do. So, for example, many of these laws restrict the amount of capital that a corporation has. There's a maximum size, they ex uh, the amount of real estate they can own. Um, even their governance, they'll have rules for how their, how their governance procedures should be uh, adopted. And throughout this period then, the well-connected people, the people who don't, uh, who don't uh, like these limitations, they can still go to their legislatures and get special charters. So we're still in a very unequal world in this period. And it's not until the second half of the 19th century, actually mostly the last third of the 19th century, that that loophole is closed and that corporations, uh, uh, that most state constitutions include provisions 
that specify that corporations cannot be chartered by special legislative act, but only under general laws. Okay. So now, let me move back to the key thing, which is voluntary associations. Um, in most states, um, a corporate charter initially required a special legislative act. Um, and for voluntary associations as well as business. And then charters, though, are mostly given for very restricted purposes, for churches, for charities, for benevolent associations, for literary societies. They're denied to lots of other organizations. And I just want to give you a few examples of how important this is, because this is when Tocqueville is writing and thinking this is such an open world. Okay. To give you an example, one thing that you can get charters for usually is religious associations. But the Free Will Baptists in New Hampshire try to get a, a charter for their printing or press, their publishing arm. And they're denied that charter. And they're denied that charter for years and years. They keep trying uh, because they're associated with abolitionism. And, and so this is something that the state does not want to encourage. Schools are things that often get charters, um, but in 1849, um, anti-Catholic feeling led the Massachusetts legislature to refuse to charter a Jesuit college. Right. Again, labor organizations repeatedly found it difficult to get uh, corporate charters unless they were clearly just going to be for benevolent purposes, for charitable purposes. And then they were often subject to stringent re uh, regulation. So here's some examples of charters in early New York that were for labor benevolent organizations. Like they had extra provisions that were very unusual, that they had to report all their finances so the state could make sure that the money wasn't being used for other purposes. Six of the charters issued between 1805 and 1820 specifically forbade the, enact, the enactment of bylaws respecting the weight, rate of wages. Okay. And almost all of the charters before 1820 included in them a threat, which is that if, if, uh, if the, these organizations strayed from their benevolent purposes and did any labor organizing, they would be punished by the seizure of all their corporate property. All right, so the politics of this is very similar um, to, uh, to the politics of banks, remarkably. So when the Federalists are in control, they get their associations. When the Democratic Republicans are in control, they want to get control of the Federalist associations, like Harvard College, like Dartmouth College. That's what you, leads to that famous uh, decision. Um, and then ultimately, you gradually come to a place where there, where there are general laws um, and uh, that this tit for tat is not going well and they decide to move to general laws. And they spread first in the north, more gradually in the south. The types of organizations that are covered expand over time, but they're still very, very restricted. So let me give you an example. This is from Pennsylvania's 1874 General Incorporation Law. Okay. So this is many years after Tocqueville. A corporate charter could be granted for just these particular purposes. Okay. You know, public worship, encouragement of agriculture and horticulture, maintenance of a club for social enjoyments, and so on, fire uh, brigades. But only these purposes, these are the only nonprofits that could get corporate charters. In 1873, Pennsylvania passed a constitution, enacted a constitution which banned special charters. So, so you couldn't even go to the legislature and get a special charter for any other purpose. This was the only kinds of charters that you could get. Not only that, but where business corporations were just formed for, uh, were just a matter of registration, when you, when you formed a corporation, you just registered it and you were in, in existence. In many states, including Pennsylvania, voluntary associations had to go through another approval hurdle. So this is, again, 1874 in Pennsylvania. Uh, I believe New York is very similar, and a number of other states. You, register a certificate 
for a voluntary association, a nonprofit corporation, but then it has to go to a judge. Okay? And then the judge is required to peruse and examine the said instrument to see if it's within the purposes named in, in the section I just showed you, and also whether it shall appear lawful and not injurious to the community, and only if the judge determines that, the, uh, that the incor this incorporated voluntary association is not injurious to the community, will the charter go into effect. Okay. And lots of them were turned down. Okay. There's actually a case law on this that some people have written about. And they might be turned down for a variety of reasons. They could be turned down because they were, because they were uh, radical. They were considered injurious to the community like Henry George, for example. Or they could be turned down just because they already had one and they wanted to protect the monopoly uh, rights, essentially, of the people who formed the organization first. All right, so let me just summarize what I've been telling you then. So what, so what I'm trying to say is that this important uh, access to organizational tools, the tools you need to make a corporation effective, right? It did not follow automatically from the American Revolution. It did not follow automatically from the Constitution. It's largely a 19th century development. And as that law suggests, even in the late 19th century, there are all these barriers to the provision of, uh, of corporate form of organizational tools to voluntary associations. Okay, that's the first important point. Second, it was an achievement of the states, not the national government. It occurred in some states much earlier than others. It occurred in some sectors much earlier than others. And there doesn't seem to be any pattern um, there's no clear pattern across states or across sectors, but political competition seems to have something to do with this, but not in a straightforward or predictable way. Think about the lag in New York uh, in provision of banking beyond, behind uh, Massachusetts. The one generalization that we can make is that open access came more fully to, bit, to organizations that were formed for business purposes, then they came to organizations that were formed for the purpose uh, for other purposes, nonprofits, um, the ones that Tocqueville um, uh, emphasized, and indeed throughout the 19th century, voluntary associations that were uh, in any way political or challenging to the established order continued to face. Um, restricted access to benefits to the to the corporate form. Okay, so um, so did this matter? <laughs> um, did it matter? Uh, well, if we think about uh, Tocqueville's world, um, Tocqueville was observing was contrasting the United States, where there was this at least right of organizations to exist, with this European world, where organizations did not have the right. Uh, to exist. And in fact, in France, and in fact, in, um, in, in Germany, uh, business organizations had a right to exist from very early on, but not social and political organizations. So business organizations are built into the Napoleonic Code. Um, and only later, though, do business organizations get access to those organizational tools associated with the corporate form. So that's the late 1860s in France and uh, a little later in Germany. But even when business ex, uh, organizations in those countries are getting access to these organizational tools, political and social organizations are still struggling for the right to exist. And in the last third of the century, it's extended uh, slowly and somewhat reluctantly. The right to exist is extended to social organizations but not these organizational tools. They are even slower to come to, to social and political organizations on the European continent. Now, when we think about this, like business organizations first, 
social and political organizations not at all, and then slowly. Uh, we think of those, that world as an illiberal world, a world that, where things did not work very well. We think of that limited access, the limit, limits on the right to exist and limited access for social and political organizations as being something that's associated with the sort of dark history of these countries in the, in the 20th century, and particularly Germany. But what I want to remind you is the United States is not the opposite extreme, right? So the United States is not the opposite extreme. The United States is somewhere intermediate. Social and political organizations have a right to exist, but, they, but business organizations get the access, the full access to organizational tools um, early, and then the spread to these other organizations is much slower, more uneven, social and political organizations. So, so what if, so the counterfactual here then is what if um, Tocqueville was really right about um, organizational tools as well as the right to exist? Would the United States have been a more democratic uh, uh, polity? Would it have been a more stable democracy? if there was open access to social and political organizations to organizational tools. When John and I first started this project, we thought the answer was obviously yes, that open access was critical. But we didn't actually know this history then. And now that I know this, we know this history, the answer is not so clear. Uh, and in fact, some of the members of our group, I'm thinking in particular of the uh, political scientist Margaret Levy, Levy um, actually uh, have serious doubts whether open access for social and political organizations is always a good thing. So while some, while limited access has certainly excluded, has hampered groups that pose challenges to the state, she would argue that it has also hampered elite dominance because Part of the limits on organizational tools that we have in the United States have come from that, from that anti-monopoly heritage which uh, the Jeffersonians and the Jacksonians represented. So I'm going to let her have the last word and then we can open up the discussion and I'm going to leave you with one picture. Uh, okay, right? <laughs> so this is um, the recent this is a reference, a cartoon in response to the recent uh, court decision, Supreme Court decision in the United States, um, uh, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. And this is now we, the corporations, not we, the people. Now, what I just want to, in closing, remind you what Citizens United was. It was not a business corporation, OK? It was a voluntary association. It was an incorporated voluntary association composed mainly of individuals, albeit a lot of them very wealthy, who were on the right side of the political uh, spectrum and wanted to, to um, amass their wealth, use it in an organized fashion to influence people's thinking about politics. So the organizational tools, which are now you know, more widely available, uh, so corporations did not have a tool to influence politics for. These are now more widely available. They're making associations like Citizens United more effective than, than they once were. Um, and so is this wider access to organizational tools a good thing or not? Well, maybe Tocqueville was right, right? Maybe, maybe all that matters is the right to exist, that, that the right to organizational uh, to access to these organizational tools is overrated. But then we have some questions. How can, how can the right to exist be maintained when some associations have better tools than others, right? When some, are, when access to organizational tools are unequal. But then we have the other problem. How can the right to exist be maintained when organizational tools are widely available, but some groups are better positioned than others to make use of them? And I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> okay, thank you.
We have 15 minutes for question and discussion. Sorry, that but, was a little long. <laughs> no, it's great. Right. Um, besides these lectures, RGCS's primary teaching activity is a student fellowship whose members meet in a reading group through the year to work through uh, text in the history of political thought and whose members last year worked through both Democracy in America and the Ancien Regime and the Revolution oh, okay. in great detail. And it is our norm at these events to hold the first question for one of the student fellows from the RGCS Student Fellowship. Yes, David. And uh, please hit the button on one of the microphones in order to ask your question and then turn it off when you're done. I first just want to say thank you for a very enlightening and interesting lecture on uh, the yeah. role of. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, you, you mentioned this uh, sort of trend insofar as uh, the general uh, allotment for incorporation rights as time went on, and it reflected certain dynamics of elite power on one side of a political spectrum or the other, for example, uh, the Democratic Republicans. Uh, I was wondering the time period to cover between before and, before and after the Civil War. Uh, if the allotment of these rights for civil organizations or otherwise also reflects uh, the dynamics of, of race. Uh, you mentioned the abolitionist printing press. Yeah. If even in the neighbor there's also uh, civil war issues as far as how these rights were allotted to various organizations by citizens and others. Right. That's a really important question. And, and unfortunately, that's, that microphone sound was hard to. But the answer, I think, is that. Um, the, abolition, the abolitionist organizations or any organizations that were aimed to uh, benefit uh, emancipated slaves or freed, I'm sorry, uh, runaway slaves were actually, they, they, had, they were just not chartered in the first half of the 19th century. The American Colonization Society had a charter, but, but that's about the only one. Um, and uh, you can see a few times people try, but mostly they don't even try. This is Tocqueville's point, right? If you, if you're not gonna, if you think you're not going to be able to get one, you're not even going to waste the resources to try. Now, what happens after the Civil War is really interesting. There's another case that's parallel to the one with uh, with Henry George, where a man leaves a, 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 an estate and wants it to benefit one a, uh, an organization that is to help former slaves. They're, this is after the war, so they're freed. And then the other is for women's rights. And the court allows the, leg, the gift to the, to the former slaves to go through. The idea is that you know, the North had fought this, the, this war to, to, um, to end slavery, and so it was an OK legacy to try to take care of these people after the war. But no, women's rights, that was not allowed to go through because that was a challenge to the, so that legacy was overturned. So it's very political throughout. Perhaps size does matter. Yes. Because de Tocqueville did note that despite the limited access, there was a great deal of citizen participation at the local level of the local assemblies. Whereas today, in the United States, supposedly, especially after Citizens United, we're supposed to have open access. In reality, we have very limited participation right. because that access has been edited to, in practical terms as opposed to uh, theoretical terms, to be uh, very limited to those who have the wealth and power. So is it only a question of size? That it com because it was small and local as compared to the large amorphous things we have today, or are there other factors at work? Well, there's undoubtedly other factors at work, uh, but size probably matters as well. But one of the factors that's at work, and John Wallace has actually written on this, is that when we went to the secret ballot, uh, the Australian ballot in the 19th century, then all of a sudden, it, uh, when the ballot's controlled by the state, then the state has to decide who gets on the ballot, right? So then, like, all, all of this uh, is regulated from the top now, whereas before, in Tocqueville's world, uh, anyone could print a ballot, 
and it, it could look like anything. Anyone could be on the ballot, and, they, and ballots were handed out, and, and people could mark them, and there was no official ballot. And when there's no official ballot, you encourage a lot of grassroots um, political activity. If I may just quickly follow up, so where do you think we're going to be headed then in terms of what is happening after Citizens United? Oh, where do I think? I don't know. I, this, I'm pretty pessimistic. I mean, I thought the last election in the United States was really distressing with huge amounts of money flowing in and, and citizens being bombarded with negative advertising every minute of the day. You just turn, turn off, right? And that's what people do. I don't know what... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, in terms of um, the open access, uh, the availability of charters is not just a benefit to organizations that want to be incorporated. It's also a benefit to states who want to control, regulate, and manage um, the organizations and um, surveil them. And so I was just wondering if you could perhaps speak to that and the dimensions in which um, so, you know, one could imagine that, in fact, not having a charter may be beneficial to certain kinds of organizations, right. especially subversive or oppositional ones, and right. um, what you might have to say about that. That's right. It's a, sort of a rock and a hard place in that, in that way. So I can say that early in the first half of the 19th century, and actually the, these examples are joined on a paper that uh, Ruth Block and I wrote for this project. Uh, in the early 19th century, states awarded charters and they were very interventionist. But over time, actually, the amount of intervention um, really tapers off and all states really do at a certain point is enforce whatever the bylaws of the, of the corporation are. So there is very, by the end of the 19th century, there's actually very little direct intervention in corporate affairs. But but so if you get a charter, you don't really have to, have to fear that kind of intervention from, from the state. Now, in what happens with labor is actually in a few states, you actually get labor agitating for the right to form corporations and then uh, securing that right. But at the same time, what happens in, those, in, in that period of history is the courts become increasingly unfriendly to labor. So with the uh, secondary boycott uh, prohibitions and the antitrust applications and so on. So, uh, so labor backs off and, and they reacted just as your question suggests. They said, we, we don't want to have anything to do with the state. This is going to be something that's going to open us to this kind of intervention. So you're absolutely right. Groups were worried about that. But the trend is to less intervention over time. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, thanks for that interesting paper. But there's a suggestion that it's corporation or nothing, basically. And um, maybe possibly in the United States, but certainly that's not the case in, the, in England, right? Take 1720. Supposedly, no more kind of incorporation, limited, depending how you read the Bubble Act. Mm -hmm. What do you have? Joint stock companies seem to basically go on and multiply as much as you can. And then there's certain procedural issues, then we get into the Gladstone Report and General Corporation are simply seen as just fixing kind of procedural litigation issues. What happens at the association level? Again, associations work exceedingly well. Uh, go to any law library and pick up a book on law of clubs, for example, from the mid-19th century. Right? Lots of case law that says these things can properly work. Same thing with unions. Unions essentially remained associations in England until their big obstacle was in 1901, which was the Taft Vale case, which then possibly created that m m senior members of the issue can be sued personally because they're not separate entity. What happened? Bit of debate, four or five years later, House of Lords just, sorry, Parliament changes the law and simply says you can't have that cause of action. So interestingly enough, uh, even though you're saying kind of a competitive environment, England, which seems to be kind of viewed always from an American perspective as much more authoritarian, seem to have had much more ability to create non, so to speak, corporate 
associations and have a much better ability to kind of plan them, whereas it seems the problem from the story you're telling them me is interesting enough in the United States, you didn't have that middle ground, therefore you had much more of a pressure to, so to speak, try to enter into the corporate form. So I understand what you're saying. Uh, and I set this up as associations versus corporations to just, um, to just lay out what I thought the bundle of organizational tools might be that might be valuable and that could be restricted by the state. But in England, but that doesn't mean that they're always going to be labeled corporations, that, that tools can be given in other forms to organizations. So in England, you essentially get organizational tools being extended after the Bubble Act, right, to uh, joint stock companies, uh, which uh, then, and, and when I say that the government is actually doing it, the courts are saying, right, that we will enforce a contract that you have made for concentrated management, for example, or will enforce a, an agreement that you have that you can sue and be sued in the name of the entity rather than having to name all the parties. But that requires the complicity of the state. It's just, it's a looser way of granting organizational tools, um, but, but it's still a way of granting organizational tools. And then what happens in England in the, in the, early, 19th, in the early 19th century, right, is the, the couple court decisions cast doubt on whether those tools are in fact going to be enforced anymore. And so then you get a, a clamor uh, on Parliament to regularize the situation. So Parliament repeals the Bubble Act first. And then the second thing, it, uh, in 1844, right, then it passes uh, essentially the first general incorporation law there. Um, interestingly, when Parliament does that, it outlaws, it outlaws uh, unincorporated joint stock companies. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or essentially, now labor, I think like Britain, whoa, you know, there's conspiracy theory in, until, you know, through the night, there are conspiracies, right? You have to worry about conspiracy prosecutions where you don't in the United States. I. I hear the point. I don't want, I don't, um, your point is that I oversimplified that there's a, I set this up too starkly, but there are intermediate, intermediate organizations that have tools. And in fact, the partnership forum today in the United States has a lot of the organizational tools now that the corporate forum has, right? Um, but, but these have only come uh, relatively recently and by deliberate, by statute, right? By deliberate ex Right, right, right. That's right. We ha we have all, um, yeah. Uh. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, let me speak briefly in defense of Tocqueville. Tocqueville's, I'm, I'm, I'm back with him at the end. <laughs> uh, well, um, Tocqueville was aware uh, that uh, the threat to soft government came fundamentally from the state, and he has a footnote to, the, to that effect. Yes, that's right. Uh, and secondly, if, you, if one were to look at the volume three, which was never published, but the letters that he wrote uh, expressing concern precisely of, of, the, of, of, the point, of the points you made. Yeah. Those letters have been brought together by Jeremy Jennings and Aurelian Kreit a few years ago, a few years back, and they were published uh, by Cambridge University yeah. Press. So I think that if one were to look closely to what he wrote, expressing concern as he followed American development after uh, 1845, he, uh, he, he was concerned. Right. Uh, the, the, just, my, I just want to say, just in, in response to that, actually, Tocqueville is not my my target, he's just, I, I know, those I quotes know. Are, I, are just sort of a foil, I, I because we tend to think I, I of U.S. history that way, right? I, I, and I'm really talking about us, not Tocqueville. I, I, I understand, okay. I understand your point. If I may s sure. make a couple more comments. Yes. The problem that I have with Douglas North, that um, he's an economist, he has no conception of politics, or very little of it, and his level of analysis is at the state, at the national level. He doesn't, he doesn't deal with, with, with things below the national level. For example, if we were to look at, at the history of, 
but not American or British, but we have to look at, at European history, and you mentioned Germany, but uh, there are other countries beyond, besides Germany. Uh, one would, would, would find that what you're looking for, I think, uh, there were mechanisms uh, at the local level through the office of the notary, the public notary uh, in Rome, in, in Malaga, in other places served precisely the functions that you are that you're mentioning. So I find your paper very interesting, but, uh, but not quite for the same reason you suggested, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I, I think that there is a lot in terms of pro public notary provided the organizational tools for all kinds of organ organizations to incorporate and become a viable entity over time. And the same applies to the Bank of Genova, which was co which the the American, the, the Federalists copied to, to establish the American, the American, the Bank of America. I don't know if I... Well, no, actually, if I were going to, uh, if I had devoted adequate time to, to Europe, I would have recognized something like that, that is, there has been a free right of association for business purposes, which the, which yeah. the state really didn't tamper with. Exactly. Uh, and that's what's so interesting yeah. about those, those countries is that, that after the, the revolution in France, the, this is just, this, is, this, this lives on, right, first in, in uh, practice and then in the Napoleonic Code where you can form all these kinds of business organizations mm -hmm. by registration, mm -hmm. right? Not the corporation, really. Uh, that's a little bit more jealousy. But you can get very close. But social and political organizations are repressed in a way that they're just not repressed in uh, in the United States. Um, but at the and so my point is, yes, these two worlds are 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 different. But the United States is not the mirror image of that other world, right? It's it's a world where there's still really quite serious political constraints on what organizations are allowed, or what organizations are allowed to do and how they're going to function. And so we are more similar to them than Tocqueville, I think, but, or at least that those, the general reading of Tocqueville would have appreciated. I had meant to squeeze in a question myself, but we're running into those time constraints, oh, okay. so I'll save it for dinner. Um, I want to close with the announcement that the next lecture in the RGCS lecture series will be January 9th in this room, given by Ilya Shapiro, professor of law at George Mason University on democracy and public ignorance. Following this lecture, as I mentioned, that sounds uh, like a good one to we invite you to <laughs> join us for a reception in the area immediately outside this room. And please join me in thanking Professor Mayor Lewin. Thank you for your comments. I just have too much to say.